great day to be out in the garden. I'm Liz Davey, and thank you for joining me on NCTV for a walk in the garden. It's now mid-September, and it's starting to look like fall around here all of a sudden. We've had some really warm days. We've had a lot of rain, but uh, now it's starting to look more like fall. There's a few leaves that are starting to fall, and many of the plants are getting kind of tired looking. They have a lot of yellow or brown leaves. I'm out in the herb garden right now, and it's time to think about what I'm gonna do with some of these plants over the winter. Some of them, like the basils, we will use, pick and use as fast as we can. Others that are perennial, like the southern wood and the thymes, they'll be just fine over the winter under a, a few fallen oak leaves. But things like the rosemary are very tender. So what I'm gonna do is dig up the rosemary. And I'm working on that right now. And I'll put it in a pot and bring it inside. You wanna get the roots out. And what I'll do is put some fresh soil in the pot with it. And uh, plant it in some uh, very well draining soil. Rosemary doesn't like to be wet over the winter, so I'll have to water it very carefully and I'll put it near a window so it'll stay fairly cool. Sometimes I put it in my front entry, but I usually forget about it there. So this year I'll try it in my sunroom near a window so that hopefully it will uh, stay cool and not get too hot and dry. I also may mist it occasionally just with some water to keep the humidity up a little bit on the leaves. The other thing we can do is collect some seeds. And I'm going to collect some seeds over here from the fennel. You can use the fennel foliage in various dishes, but you can also use the fennel seeds in breads and some of the other things. And they're uh, ripening up and ready to just fall off into a cup. You could also just pick the whole thing and put it in a paper bag and it would collect the uh, fennel seeds. Again, you want to collect seeds on a dry day if possible. Certainly don't want to go out in the rain. But I'll just keep collecting these as they ripen. Any seeds I collect that I want to save, I will put into a low oven just to make sure they aren't carrying any hitchhikers in the way of insects. and. Uh, that will help kind of pasteurize them so that they will last a little longer. You don't want to really brown them, you just want to heat them up enough to kill any insects. So we'll keep uh, harvesting on the fennel. Dill seeds can also be harvested in the same way if you have dill. And we can certainly continue to use the foliage and also any of the leaves. Even though the mint's gone to seed uh, and gone to flowers and, and seeds, there are still some mint sprigs available that we can use. Many other things are still here as well. Lemon verbena, I've tried to bring inside. Uh, it really does not come in well. I'm not even going to bother. I did do some cuttings. We'll try again to see if we can get the cuttings to do something. Time. We can continue to pick thyme out here, even though it frosts, the thyme will still be usable right up until it's covered with snow. The same is true of the sage. Uh, there's been many of Thanksgiving morning that I came out and picked sage and thyme as I was preparing my Thanksgiving stuffing. The chives will go when it frosts, but they're available right now and you can still harvest a few of those. Winter savory, uh, is at its peak for drying. Just cut the sprigs. Any of them can now be cut back to be dried. Don't forget the non-edible herbs. They make uh, good little bouquets to put around if you have a problem with mice trying to get into the house. Uh, just put some of those sprigs around and it does help repel any mice or insects. Let's move over to the perennial garden now and see what's going on over there. In the perennial garden, it, the season is here for fall flowers. The summer blooming flowers are pretty much finished, but things like boltonia, 
and various asters are now starting to bloom. Also, uh, this is uh, Eupatorium chocolate. It's had kind of chocolatey dark foliage all season, and now it's going to be putting on some white blooms, just some nice white frosting on top of the dark plant. Pods are now evident and uh, more apparent than they were. These can be picked for fall arrangements or you can open them up and save the seeds. This is a Baptisia and I will probably save some of the seeds from this one. Uh, it will probably go to seed if I don't. So I will either pick the pods and save the seeds for the most part maybe let a few grow so I'll have some starts later. In the background you see one of the cannas that's still blooming. They tend to bloom a little later in the season but uh, they're almost finished. This is a golden rod. You see it along the sides of the road certainly but also there are various varieties of it. I think there's something like 20 plus varieties that will grow here in Massachusetts. It is a native plant it is not the cause of allergies. Uh, people mistakenly think it is because it is the bright thing that's blooming. Ragweed is the culprit and ragweed has green blossoms that are very, very non-showy. And so people think it's the goldenrod pollen. It is not. Goldenrod comes in various varieties and has even been hybridized. There are several varieties. One particular one called Fireworks, which has uh, like fireworks, plumes that come out of it in golden yellow in the fall. But it does add color to the garden and pollinators love it. Many times it's out here it's been covered with bees. Some of the annuals are still blooming and asters are starting to come into bloom. Got one over here that's got a few blossoms but you'll see there are a lot of buds. So these in another week will be in full bloom. We have pods on the butterfly weed. These will open and um, there will be a lot of seeds inside. Again, I can save those. There are a few daisies blooming. The uh, black-eyed Susans are gone, but I've left these pods and they've been a favorite with the goldfinches. These are seeds that are in the top and they absolutely love them. So they will come down and perch on the uh, black-eyed Susans and consume the seeds. So I leave them there. Other things that are starting to turn brown, like this old lily, I can cut right down. This can be composted and just cut to the ground. And as things brown off, I will be cutting them and putting them in the compost. It's the last bloom, last roses of summer. And we have a few blooms and a few buds on this uh, particular rose, pink. I have a couple other roses and they too are putting on the last few blooms. Do not deadhead them. Normally on roses, once the bloom is gone, you would deadhead it. What follows the bloom will be rose hips. Now, most of the hybrid roses don't have noticeable hips uh, like the beach roses do. But nonetheless, you want the rose to start going into dormancy. If it starts putting on a lot of new growth, it will be killed when the first frost comes. The first frost date in Massachusetts averages about the middle of the month. Some years you get a couple more weeks, some years you get it to coming a little earlier than that. It depends on a lot of things, not the least of which is your location and how protected your garden is. Some parts of my garden are not protected much at all from the wind and they will be frost killed earlier. But you don't want your, you want your roses to start thinking it's time to go dormant. So don't fertilize them now. Uh, no fertil fall fertilizer for roses. And after they bloom, let the hips stay on the roses. Usually, as I said, you take them off to encourage further bloom, but you don't want that at this point. We have Celosa here, which we planted as an annual. And again, once this is gone, and it'll stay right through the frost, but once it's gone, we can just pull that. You'll notice a lot of grass-like plants here. Those are grape hyacinths. And both grape hyacinths and poppies put up fall growth. 
and that's normal. Uh, it will be killed back slightly when it does frost or freeze, and it'll come back up next spring, but that's a normal part of their growth cycle, so don't worry that they're coming up too soon. In the back, we have sedums, and the sedums now have turned pink. They started out green. They will become a rust, rusty red color in another couple weeks. In the background, I have the hydrangea, which has not bloomed. The name of that one's Sadie Ray, and Sadie Ray doesn't particularly like this location. So Sadie Ray is going to take a trip next spring. She's on my list, and she's going to move to a new location, and if she doesn't like it there, uh, she will leave town. <laughs> so Sadie Ray is on the list, as are a few other things that need to be divided and pruned. I'll need to uh, divide some of the black-eyed Susans. I'm getting quite a few again, and they do spread. Some of the sedums, if they start to fall over, means that they need to be divided as well. We still have flocks, and some of the annuals that reseeded themselves are still going strong, as well as some marigolds in the background. Again, here's another aster. This one's a purple one. The ones before were pink. And we have some chrysanthemums that are blooming. Throughout the summer, up until July 4th, I pinched back the foliage on this chrysanthemum. If I hadn't pinched it, it would be this tall and have just a few blooms on the top. So what we wanted to do is keep it short and keep it full. And you'll notice it's full of blooms, so we'll have a nice compact chrysanthemum plant at that location. Moving back this way, the butterfly bush is still going. We have some, some blooms on it, and I have continued to deadhead that. It will, uh, we will cut that back all the way next spring. So I'm not too worried about it putting on new growth now. The new growth will not stay. So we can keep cutting it back and keep getting some blooms. The butterflies are few and far between, and I haven't seen a hummingbird for quite a while. So that tells me it's time to remove my hummingbird feeder, clean it out, wash it well, and put it away for the winter. Hummingbirds are in Massachusetts from about the 1st of May until the middle of September. After that, they migrate. The only hummingbird we have here is the ruby-throated hummingbird. There are many varieties which are, you can see south of here. But in uh, Massachusetts, we have the ruby-throated that comes in May and leaves in September. So it's safe to remove your hummingbird feeder as soon as you stop seeing hummingbirds coming to it. Just one of the ways to start getting ready for fall. These pots of plants, again, these are the pineapple lilies and I've been taking off the actual lilies themselves. And these will be moved inside. I can wait until after the first frost, or I can take them in any time. Perhaps put them in the shed so that they go dormant. They will be kept in a cool room. Uh, if I had a cellar, I would put it in the cellar. I don't have a cellar, so I will put them in uh, an unused bedroom that stays quite cool and then bring them out in the spring. I have several pots of those. We'll also do that with the uh, canna lilies and the dahlias. I'm going to pick some, uh, dig some of the dahlias after they have, and the cannas, once the frost has blackened their foliage. That usually takes a fairly hard frost to have the foliage go completely. Just keeping watch of the garden and keeping it weeded. There are still a few weeds here and there. Using things like the lemon verbena. I plant lemon verbena over here instead of my herb garden. Actually, I have one in each garden. This one does better because it gets more sun. My herb garden is starting to get more shade from the trees overhead. But I'll be picking this one to dry for tea. It will go, it's a tropical plant and it will go at the first sign of frost. The same is true of the lemon grass. I have one that I'm going to bring in the house. This one will not survive. 
and we can dig that out after it is killed by the frost. This is another aster, purple one, and uh, it will be in full bloom in another week or so. Now it's time to go into the vegetable garden and see what's going on over there. Next to the vegetable garden, I've planted a few amaryllis bulbs. These are bulbs that bloomed last winter, and I put them out here for the summer, to spend the summer outside. But it's time now to fork them up, and we want to get some good roots. And I'm going to let these dry. What I'll do after I have them out is take them into my shed and let them dry a while, and then I'll replant them in new, fresh potting soil a little later on. And hopefully, by February or March, we'll have some more amaryllis blossoms. But you can see they've uh, formed a nice bulb out here over the summer. And I want to carefully fork them up. You don't want to uh, break the bulb in the process. If you do plant these early, you would not water them. You want them to stay dormant a little bit until you're ready for them to put on new foliage. This foliage will die back when I put them in uh, without water. They're getting plenty of water with the rain this year. But we'll keep those in the shed for a while. Then I can repot them and bring them inside before we have a really cold time. And I will start not water them right away. I'll wait to water them until I want them to start growing again. I like to have my amaryllis bloom. A lot of people like them for Christmas, and they would start, to start them in maybe October. I'll probably wait until closer to December because I find that when I need the color is more into February and March. So that's when I'm looking for their, them to bloom. So you can actually time when you want the flowers in your home with the amaryllis bulbs. Stepping into the garden, we're still getting some yellow tomatoes. The flowers have gone crazy, and there's plenty to pick for bouquets. I have the late crops that we planted. We have radishes. A lot of nice radishes here we can add to salads. Lettuce, red lettuce, green lettuce. few weeds here and there, and uh, cilantro, which I'm going to be using today in the kitchen, uh, a few carrots, a few beets, some everlasting flowers, and these aren't quite ready. They're almost ready when it's uh, a little drier outside, probably this weekend, to be picked and saved. These are status, the kind that come in your florist's arrangements, but they do grow here in the summer, so I will have uh, an assortment of white flowers as fillers for any bouquets I want to make. I still have uh, some other things that can be picked. Uh, parsnips will be dug after the frost. That's when they're the sweetest. And we have our strawberries, of course, which uh, I'll add more straw once the ground freezes. A little more lettuce here and there. Certainly a lot of kale. Uh, arugula, tomatoes, and of course the calendula flowers, which have bloomed all summer. They're a long, long blooming plant. Uh, amaranth this is the red one, and unfortunately it will go to seed, and I'll have amaranth all over the place next year, but I really don't mind because it's very easy to weed out. The zinnias will be gone after the first frost, and the marigolds definitely will go. If you come out and the marigolds have completely disappeared, you know that uh, you've had a frost. They will just turn to black almost immediately, as will the basil. And I have basil on the other side of the garden, and we'll move over there a little bit. Oh, this is a new flower for me. It's taken a long time to come into bloom, but it's a, a carrot relative. It was developed as a new type of carrot 
but they found it didn't make carrots, it made flowers. So now they're selling it as a flower, a flowering carrot. And uh, I probably needed to plant it inside a little bit, give it an earlier start. But I'm starting to get some blooms on it. And they're going to be kind of a dark red, almost like a Queen Anne's Lace flower. Uh, I thought it looked interesting, and I think it will be. If I do it next year, I will try to plant some inside so that it will produce some flowers a little before the end of September. Now we'll move over to the other side. Around the wall of flowers. On the other side of the wall of flowers are the beans. Now earlier in the season, the rabbits pretty much ate down my green and yellow beans. Now that the rabbits have decided to move on a little bit, uh, I'm getting a few yellow and green beans, enough for a meal occasionally. But I have two other kinds of beans in the garden. And one of them is black beans. And this is the plant, and you can see the beans on it. And I just let the bean pods stay on it until they've dried. And they look kind of nasty, but you'll see I have some lovely black beans inside the pod. And those are ready that I can shell them out. And then we can cook them right away. Or if I want to save them again, I will put them in the oven. We'll probably do that next month. But I'll let these dry well before storing them. The other beans that I have are lima beans. And they are down in here, just a few. And they're making some lovely little lima beans. And again, those get shelled out and they can be cooked and eaten. Plenty of basil. This is lemon basil. I have some lime basil uh, also here. This one's the lime basil. And uh, the broccoli is still putting on heads. And I cut it down pretty well a couple weeks ago. And it's still forming heads. And it will continue even after a frost. The Brussels sprouts, I have Brussels sprouts in several spots. We, we like them. I'd like to get some sprouts. Not sure how that's going to work out. This is broccoli. These are Brussels sprouts. I've taken the middle of each Brussels sprout and cut it. Cut it off right in the middle. The idea is I don't want them to grow tall. I want them to grow sprouts. And the sprouts grow around the bottom of the stem. We'll be able to see that later on. Again, both broccoli and Brussels sprouts can stay in the garden after the frost. They'll be just fine. If I still had tomatoes going, and I do have cherry tomatoes that might be going, I could run out and throw a sheet over it when a light frost was predicted. But I doubt I will do that because I've had enough. Uh, again, more Brussels sprouts. You can see better here where I've cut the top out and it's forming the little sprouts along the stems. And those will have another month or so to grow. This is kale, and kale actually becomes sweeter after a frost, so that certainly will stay in the garden too. I have plenty of parsley, uh, a few peppers here and there. I've had very good luck with hot peppers this year that I planted in my back flower bed. They are in full sun, and they seem to have done well. I have eight or ten jalapeno peppers. We uh, eat some, and uh, I'm using those in today's recipes. The summer squash is about gone. I've pulled some of it. When it turns completely brown, we're unlikely, even though I have some blossoms here, most unlikely to get any more summer squash. It would be very unusual. So I'll be just pulling up this uh, foliage and putting it in the compost. It's pretty well gone anyway, and we'll clear out this spot. I have a few tiny eggplant. I never seem to grow too, eggplant too well. This is a climbing bean, it's an antique bean. I thought it was gone because of the uh, rabbits really enjoyed it. But I do have some blossoms, and I find this has very unique blossoms on it. <coughs> I'm kind of a pink and orange. And I'm hoping to get enough beans to have seed so that I can plant more. 
This was given by a Native American to my husband uh, with the thought that we would send them back some seeds. Uh, the rabbits may have interfered with that, but I'm hoping to get at least enough to replant next year and maybe then get some seeds from it. This is Sweet Annie, and it is not edible, but it is a, a very aromatic herb. It's in the Artemisia family. Often it has been used, uh, sometimes it's called Amish uh, room deodorizer because it has kind of a fresh scent to it. And I will be picking some of this and it will go in my entryway just as a, a bouquet. As it dries, it still emits the lovely scent. It's in bloom right now. It has little yellowish blooms, which are kind of pretty. And it does have a very aromatic odor to it. Again, this will reseed. I'll have to watch for it coming up next year and either pot it up and share it or uh, pull it out if, I, if it grows in places that I don't want it. I have plenty of parsley and parsley will come back next year. So even when everything else is finished, I'll leave the parsley in the garden because uh, parsley is a biennial. That means it comes up from seed the first year and doesn't bloom, but the second year it will come up again, but it will put up a bloom stalk and then it will form seed and reseed itself. This is first year parsley, so I'll leave it here. Hopefully it will come up next spring unless we have a really horrible cold winter and then it will bloom and reseed. I have both the uh, flat leaf and the curly leaf parsley. I'll be sure to pick enough and bring it in the house to save for winter. It will die back, but it will return come spring. So it's good to mark that or keep a stakes in or a piece of string so that you know where to expect it next spring. Cucumber. My cucumber vine is about gone. I still have a couple cucumbers on the vine and uh, I may leave those there. I have a recipe for ripe cucumber pickles. And you certainly can't buy ripe cucumbers, but they do form in your garden if you just leave a couple of the big ones there. They will turn yellow, and they make an excellent pickle, kind of a sweet and sour pickle. So I'm going to leave those and see if I can get enough to make a recipe. Now let's move over by the cuttings. These are the cuttings I did. We did some about a month ago. Those are in the back, and I've done a new tray of cuttings in the last couple weeks. Uh, the ones in the back have started rooting. If you kind of tug on it a little, you realize that they are sitting in there quite firmly. They've formed some roots. I usually put three or four small sprigs in each container. Once they've rooted, however, I'll need to transplant them so that they each have their own container. I will be bringing these in and putting them under lights uh, very soon. And then in about a month, they'll be ready. They'll be growing, starting to put on some new leaves, perhaps. And uh, then I can see what survives and move those into individual pots to be kept over the winter. And I will uh, fertilize them lightly in the winter and keep them growing so that they'll be ready to set out again next year. I, you can even take cuttings from the cuttings once they grow, if they grow high enough. Again, I'll keep pinching them, and the pinching in the middle of the little new growth will enable them to branch. That's particularly true of the coleus plants that are in here. And it's one that roots very easily and uh, is very amenable to being divided. Comes in various colors. I like the greenish yellow ones. Any container plants you have, you can continue to water, and certainly any new perennials you've put in this year, you can continue to water if we don't get sufficient rainfall. We've gotten four inches in the last uh, four days, so I'm not going to need to water for a while. But uh, be aware that if we do have a dry spell between now and about the end of October, you do need to water anything you've put in new, especially trees. You want it to get a good start and root. Uh, any containers, I have dahlias that will, again, be blackened by frost, and I can dig those along with the cannas. But right now, we're just enjoying them, and uh, 
waiting for the end of summer. I replaced the hooker that was in here with a chrysanthemum and I planted the hooker in the ground. I knew it wouldn't survive. It's a perennial. It won't survive in a pot above ground without a lot of insulation. So I just planted it in the ground and I'll keep it watered well and hope it roots well and comes up again next spring. Now let's head back to the shade garden. This is a shade plant that's blooming right now. It's Kelone, uh, but it's also known as uh, turtle head. You can see that, that the uh, little flowers look kind of like a turtle head. This, it is a native plant in Massachusetts in its white form, and I'll show you one of those in a few minutes. This is the pink form, and it is a hybrid, and it's called hot lips. So it's Kelone. C-H-E-L-O-N-E, -E, which doesn't sound like it's pronounced, but it is turtle head, and uh, this one is hot lips. It adds a little color to the shade garden. When there isn't much color, the hostas are all starting to get brown. I uh, will eventually remove all the foliage, but I take the brown, some of the brown foliage out just for neatness sake or not, uh, depending on what I want the look to be. But all of the hosta and everything will die back except the hillebores and some of the ferns that are more hardy. But the Kelone blooms in late September. It's a late bloomer and kind of fun to have. Heading back toward the pond, starting to think about winter back here at the pond. I'm going to continue to feed the fish and I'm going to be adding the, uh, tying up the pond thermometer. And uh, once the temperature goes below 50, I will stop feeding the fish. Uh, we decrease their feed now, starting now, as the weather cools. And once the water temperature goes down, it's time to stop feeding them. They go into almost a hibernation state. They will stay here all winter. Should be just fine as long as I keep a hole in the ice, which we'll go into later. But right now my thing is leaves. My pond is in the shade. You can already see the leaves are starting to fall. So I've started removing the plants. And by this weekend, I will remove all of them. I have an old sprinkler base that I've put in the pond, and this works well. I have a shelf in the pond, so one of the legs I can adjust shorter so that this sits upright and this is going to hold the net that I'm going to put over the whole pond and the net will stay on probably until there's a skim of ice on the pond or it starts to ice over in the morning. Uh, I took it off a little early two years ago and lo and behold the heron came and ate all my fish so I want to make sure I leave the net on long enough this year that the heron may not be as interested in the fish and certainly won't be when there's ice on the top. So the rest of the plants will come out. They'll come inside for the winter if I choose to bring them in. Again, uh, choosing what to bring in and what to leave out is always a big question based on space and, and uh, what you feel has done well and you'd like to keep for another year. I've removed the annual plant that was up there so I won't be covering it with the netting. And this is uh, uh, impatience. And the impatience go to seed. And it forms a little seed head. And I've kept my little paper or plastic cup out here. And here's one of the seed heads. And if you touch them, they pop open. And the seeds pop out. And you have to do touch them over the cup or else the seed will all be spilled. But it's inside this little capsule. And I want to save seeds so that I can plant these impatience again next year. And it's very easy to save it. You just pop the little things. They're kind of fun to pop too. So I keep looking for them. This one, uh, a lot of them, I think, got broken with the rains we just had. But they do form these little seed capsules. There's some in formation right now. Again, uh, once we get a hard frost, the impatience will completely dissolve into the planting material. 
and they need to be discarded. I have tried bringing in patients in the house and I've not been really successful with it. They seem to harbor, no matter how much you spray, they seem to harbor insects, which I really don't want to bring in the house. So I just let them go, save their seeds, and plant more for next spring, and they'll do just fine. Let's see, we've got clippers here. Any hosta that has still have seed pods, unless you plan to hybridize or save seeds, just cut off the seed pods of those and start taking some of the foliage. The foliage on the hosta starts to look really uh, pretty ratty at this uh, season. So you can start cutting it back here and there, depending on uh, where they are and what you want to see. This is the uh, white kiloni or turtle head. You can see this nice little turtle head with his mouth open when you squeeze it. And uh, this is the white form, and this is a native plant that grows in uh, wetter areas. Uh, it likes a little sun, but it does take shade, mostly shade. Again, deciding what to bring in is one of the things we can do. Now let's move up towards the house and get ready to take some in. Before the last rain, I pulled out all of my house plants that are usually in and let them get a good wash. And I also brought out, uh, have been bringing up to this area, all those plants that are going to go into the sunroom for the winter. And I have neem spray that I'm using, and I want to spray these plants, probably not when it's too sunny, which is today. And I want to give each plant a good spritz of the neem, both sides of the leaves for many of them. This again avoids bringing in things I don't want brought in the house. And uh, this planter will stay out. I'll be taking cuttings of the, the uh, geraniums but the others will be coming in, and I'll trim some of them back before they come in. Trim off any dead parts. Uh, add some new soil if it needs it. Sometimes uh, when plants are out for the summer, the soil kind of goes down. Uh, this is a house plant that has been inside and stayed inside for a couple years. I'll probably cut it back a little. It tends to get a little too large. So do a little cutting back. We won't fertilize them too much. But I do want to give everything a good spray before they come in. This helps eliminate some of the problems. The Voganvillea is going to have to be, uh, it's starting to lose some of its blossoms. It's really blossoming beautifully at this season. This is a tropical plant. If you've been to California or Florida, you've seen them there. And I've kept this one alive for probably 20, 25 years. I do cut it back in the winter, and it looks sad come spring, <laughs> I must admit. It, it, uh, it stays alive, but uh, it does look a little sadder. And I do have to cut it back before I bring it in because I can't get it through the door if I don't. It uh, gets a little too tall in the summer, so I'll have to take the top off at least. And then we'll bring it in, and I'll be picking up after it all winter as these uh, beautiful brackets come off. Uh, it really is, it's so much brighter outside than it is inside. It's amazing what natural sunlight can do. It gets sun inside through the window, but uh, it stays really beautiful here. This is a vinca, and uh, it's been potted. I brought it in last winter and uh, kept it over. It was very full, and then uh, a stem broke off during one of the storms, the whole side of the plant. So I have cuttings of it, and the cuttings seem to be doing well. I will probably cut this one back before I bring it in or shortly thereafter. Uh, you see we have one side that's quite good, but the other side is what came off. So instead of just throwing it away, I thought, well, I'll try to make some cuttings from it. And so far, so good. So I may have lots of little, little, uh, plants 
to give away come spring. It's a pantus. I'm sorry, it's not a vinca. It's pantus. Uh, penta is five, and each little bloom has five petals. Hence, that's probably where it got its name. Now, let's go in and see what we can do with some of the produce that we picked in the garden. We are football fans. College football, pro football, we are football fans. Therefore, I like to make some things for our own tailgates so that we can watch those games and have some good snacks along the way. I'm trying a few different things uh, and some that are not so different. The first thing I'm going to make are some cheesy thumbprint cookies. Now, these are not sweet cookies particularly. They're an hors d'oeuvre. And I have in the mixer a cup of butter. And to that I'm going to add three tablespoons of sugar and a half teaspoon of salt. And I'll mix that to cream it. And then I'm going to add cheese. Three and a half ounces each of shredded Monterey Jack cheese and cheddar cheese. Get it all in there. And one chopped jalapeno pepper. I told you I had jalapenos in abundance. And also in that addition was a chopped large sprig of rosemary from the herb garden. And we'll mix that around. And a small egg. Scrape it down a little bit. And now I want to add the flour. And this is a cup and a half of flour. Actually, the recipe was a flour with a weight, and the weight would have been 6.7 ounces. And then I'm going to add 5.3 ounces or about a cup of semolina. And semolina is a more coarsely ground wheat. It's a creamier color. It's found in many pastas to give it a, an off-white color. And I'm going to mix that up until everything's nice and combined. Get rid of the mixer at this point. Then I'm going to use my fingers to make about one and a half inch balls and put them on the baking sheet. A little bigger. This should make a couple dozen. I would say. At least a couple dozen, maybe a few more. We'll start out with a dozen. I already have my oven preheated to 400 degrees. This is just like making cookies, if you've ever made this type of cookie. There we have a dozen. And then I will make the spot in the middle using my thumb. That's why they're called thumbprint cookies. And if you were making sweet cookies, a uh, dessert type cookie, you would probably be filling this with jam or chocolate or some other type of sweet filling. 
But since this is an hors d'oeuvre instead, I'm going to fill it with a tomato bourbon jam that I made. And this is basically tomatoes cooked with vinegar and sugar and uh, some cumin, some garlic, some onion, uh, and a little bourbon. And we're going to fill each of the thumbprints with a little of this jam. I used my cherry tomatoes for this. I've had quite a few of those. and. We also added some hot pepper flakes. So this will be a little uh, little bit spicy for those who like a little spice. This only took about 20 minutes to cook. Uh, basically you just added everything together and started it boiling. Then you added three tablespoons of bourbon and continued cooking until it was of a jam-like consistency. The jam is also would be good with just with crackers separately or spread on bagels. We'll put this in the oven for about 20-25 uh, minutes at 400. Or I'm sorry, at 350, not at 400. So I have oven set at different temperatures here. So 350 for about 20 minutes. I'll set the timer for 20. We'll take a look and see if they're finished. Now, the next thing we're going to make is over on this side, and it is uh, stuffed potato skins. I already did the potato skins. I baked the potatoes. I scooped out the insides. I cut them in half, scooped out the insides, and uh, we had mashed potatoes for supper last night. Uh, then I brushed the skins with a combination of one tablespoon melted butter and one tablespoon of oil. And that was for five potatoes, which made 10 potato halves. I brushed inside and out and put it back in the oven for about 15 minutes on a baking sheet, uh, face down until the shells were nice and crispy. Now you could fill them with just about anything. You could have used the potatoes that came out of them that's been spiced up with things, or you could have added add meat. But I'm going to make a bacon and kale pesto. Uh, for these with cheese. And in the uh, food processor, I have two large cloves of garlic, and I'm going to add three quarters of a cup of almonds. You could also use pine nuts. One cup of chickpeas. This adds a little protein, because these can be almost a whole meal. Let's see, we've got a few almonds left in here. A quarter cup of Parmesan cheese, five ounces of kale, and I've washed this and, and uh, taken the stems off. And I may have to add this a little gradually as we go. We'll see. And a handful of basil. And I'll just pull the leaves off the stems on this one. If you want to pick basil in advance, it turns pretty ugly in the refrigerator, but it uh, lasts quite well if you just put it into a little container on the kitchen cupboard. And it also tends to keep fruit flies away and smells quite good. People will think you're cooking even if you aren't. And then we'll add a quarter cup of olive oil. And then I probably will add the rest of the kale a little later. And we will process that. And there we, we have quite a, a good paste going. I'm going to take it off the processor and fill our potatoes with it. Adding some for each one. Kale is a vegetable that's very good, very nutritious. And it's nice to find different ways to work it in to the menu. And I'm 
going to top them with uh, five slices of cooked and crumbled bacon. And some cheese, and this can be jack cheese or cheddar. I'm using jack cheese. Then we're going to put this back into the oven, and we want to heat it up for about 10 minutes until the cheese gets nice and melty into the kale. And that's going in at 400 degrees for about 10 minutes. Uh, since the potato skins were in the refrigerator, it may take a little bit longer to get them nice and hot. And the last thing I'm going to make is just a salsa. And uh, if you have garden tomatoes, it, uh, it's about the end of the tomato season, I've been told, at the farmer's market. So now is the time to get them and use them. And I've been picking quite a few since it was raining. And I'm going to add to about five cups of tomatoes that have been peeled. Now to peel a tomato, I like to put them in a metal bowl and pour boiling water over them. You could also use a colander or a, a pan, a baked cooking pan. But I pour boiling water over the tomatoes after they've been washed and then immediately pour it out and add cold water you'll find the skin slip right off the tomatoes. Uh, you just peel it off and core them and then chop them up. Uh, you can seed them if you wish. I did not seed them completely. I squeezed out some of the seeds, but I left most of them in. But there are no tomato skins in the mixture. You can leave them in if you wish, but I didn't. Uh, I'm going to add a little heat in the, the Two or three sliced up jalapeno peppers. Again, that's uh, up to you how many you wish to add, or you could use a little hot sauce too. We have about four cloves of garlic, very finely minced again, a cup and a half of chopped onion. and about a cup and a half of chopped cilantro. We happen to like cilantro. Some you, people either love it or hate it. If you don't like it, you could use parsley or you could just leave it out altogether. But if you like it, it's nice to add and uh, I do have it in the garden right now fresh. With that, I'm going to use a half a teaspoon of lime zest and about three tablespoons of lime juice. And that's it except for a little salt, which I will add. I seldom salt things, but I think this is going to need, need about a half a teaspoon. But we eat very little salt, so I did not salt the potato mixture. It had a lot of seasoning, but uh, you could salt any of these things a little more than I did. And we'll mix it all together and We'll have it ready to serve with our chips. You can adjust the seasoning after you taste it. If you want to add more heat, you can add either more peppers or uh, a little hot sauce. I purposely didn't want it too hot. But we'll serve that along with some corn chips as part of our tailgate. And the next thing I have that I made, which I'm not going to show how to make it. It was a little messy, but I'll tell you how to make it. And these are turtle apple slices. They're chocolate-covered apple slices with caramel and pecans. And basically, I sliced an apple. That's one apple that made four. 
and my directions that I found said to use a popsicle stick, but I didn't have any popsicle sticks, but I did have lollipop sticks. So I just put a lollipop stick into each apple slice. Then I melted chocolate in the microwave. And these are chocolate chips with a little bit of coconut oil mixed in uh, and carefully melted it. Uh, it only took about a minute or a minute and a half. And I did the same thing with some caramel. I first dipped my apple slices into the chocolate and I put them on a piece of parchment on a baking sheet and then I chilled them a little bit until the chocolate got hard. And then uh, I melted some caramel and these could be craft caramels with perhaps a little milk to according to package directions, or the caramel bits. These were the caramel bits. And then I just drizzled a little of the caramel over each of the chocolate apples. And while it was still wet, I sprinkled it with chopped pecans. So these are caramel apple, turtle caramel apple slices, having the chocolate caramel and pecans. And that's our dessert. It makes a little smaller dessert than doing a whole apple. Usually, uh, if you do a whole apple, you kind of, at least I run out of being hungry before I run out of apple. So that's a, a little smaller portion. Let's get out our thumbprint cookies and put them on a plate for serving. I think these would be good either hot or cold. I suspect maybe room temperature is about right, but right now they're pretty hot. They're a little different hors d'oeuvre. And again, I think you could make the same recipe and vary it slightly as far as the uh, flavorings and the filling. They also should freeze fairly well, but I would not stack them one on top of the other unless I put wax paper between them if I were going to freeze a few for later, which might be the case. Then you would just perhaps reheat them in the oven if they needed it. Now let's get out our potato skins. bacon and cheese. And there we have a nice little tailgate set up so that I can go and watch the game and come over and get a snack without spending my whole day in the kitchen. I've been doing a little preserving as well and I made uh, relish with the generous supply of cucumbers I had. This is just a pickle relish and I, we have some of that for the winter. And using some of the zucchini and also the mint from the herb garden, I've made several loaves of banana, zucchini, and mint bread, which uh, I keep in the freezer and it's nice to bring out on a cold, snowy day to have a little taste of summer put away in the freezer. I'm Liz Davey, and you've been watching A Walk in the Garden on NCTV, Norfolk Community Cable TV.